So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our second panel of the day, which I'm sure is bound to be a very interesting one. We're going to be talking about scalability through the Lightning implementations. And speaking on this panel, we have uh, Fabrice Druin uh, from Async. Uh, we have um, Christian Decker uh, from um, Blockstream. And we have Taz Dreja from our very own MIT DCI. So let's give it up for our panelists. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Okay. So we'll, we're talking about the history, right? Right, or whatever you guys want <laughs> to know. Yeah, if, if, so this is sort of an open panel. If people have questions and want to yell things, you can do that. Um, I guess the history of payment channels is probably like, you know, Satoshi wrote about it. Oh, I, I mean, yeah. I mean the uh, the interesting part is I, I just gave a lecture on this on uh, on uh, Thursday, and uh, <coughs> holy moly, this is strong. <laughs> I, I'm a weak a weak little engineer, so that doesn't count. Um, so uh, what I usually do is I ask people what what their first uh, what the first off-chain payment channel system is. And usually they, they will go for the Spielman style uh, payment channels, right? The unidirectional ones, I sign and give it to you, and then you have the choice. Um, but if you really squint at it sideways, the end sequence mechanism is already a payment channel mechanism where we could have a state represented by a transaction, and we could just, just well, change it over and over again. It didn't work, though. <laughs> Right, it, like the, it, 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 it didn't, but uh, it, but it was the idea was there. It's like the it's idea called was the end yeah. sequence, and it, it goes up and it replaces. But it, in the early versions of Bitcoin, there was the idea there of like let's have a pay. He called them like high frequency channels or something, and it didn't actually work. But the idea was was certainly there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know that like Mike Hearn was working on implementations for Bitcoin J. So like the idea of payment channels was sort of in Bitcoin from the beginning. Um, and then I guess the the lightning side. There was then there was a uh, the the de decrementing or your thing. Your yeah, decrementing the, the time time locks. Uh, what was that called? Uh, du duplex market payment du channels. Yeah, duplex. I, I want to grab the name and uh, uh, sort of grab the idea and, and name squat you guys, but that didn't help. <laughs> oh yeah. So so then, but you know that one was you can you know the the. The time where it expires keeps getting closer, and so you can reverse direction that way. And then I guess with Lightning, it was uh, you sort of reveal keys. You needed uh, op check sequence verify, which then sort of reintroduced the sequence and sequence field. Um, but this time it it worked in a like in mm -hmm. consensus compatible way. Uh, and then part of it then was also like I guess it got like it's it's sort of weird because it got like wrapped up in like. Segwit and like Bitcoin splitting and all these weird things and so like I know a lot of people on like our BTC like hate lightning and like hate me and it's like oh okay I don't know uh, <laughs> and so it's it, it has been like a weirdly polarizing thing and also now there's all these like people on Twitter with like lightning little emojis in their names I'm like I don't know like so <laughs> so so it's not just a protocol I guess there's like all sorts of other things going on with it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people really, really seem to like and, and really seem to identify with Lightning. I probably should use this. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's fascinating how much how much of a, a grassroots movement this has become uh, from from a, an academic paper in 2015 uh, that was born out of an idea that we probably had all, all along, which is always the case with Bitcoin, by the way. Uh, if you think you have a great idea, then there will be Bitcoin a Bitcoin talk, talk, talk post somewhere talk that, 2011, that, yeah. Greg, maybe, you know, someone's already thought of it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, this, this whole thing is just taking off and exploding. And, and uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes it's scary to look at the amount of money that is currently in the, in the Lightning Network, to be honest. Um, and uh, it's it's just been a wild ride so far. Yeah. Although it, it you know 2015 nobody really it wasn't you know so the first when when Joseph and I published the paper I was working at a different company uh, it wasn't something I worked on most of the time Joseph 
just sort of hung out. Like, nobody really cared, and then, like, slowly it got to be more popular, and everyone's like, oh, you should work on this. Uh, so it wasn't. And, and I think for, for stuff you were working on, like uh, other people too, it w there wasn't as much interest yeah, in uh, 2014 the, the The fun part is that uh, the, uh, Sea Lightning at least got started uh, by, by Rusty uh, when he joined Blockstream and uh, he was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting my, my 20 years Linux uh, job and I'm now, now going to work on Bitcoin Core and I'm freshing up more my C++ and oh, by the way, I wrote this small blog post about how Lightning is working. So when he interviewed he was told, yeah, uh, glad you can join. Uh, do you want to work on Lightning? Here's your pro own project. And he was like, but I wanted to go Bitcoin Core. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he seems to be OK with it now. And um, I, I think he actually enjoys working on, on, uh, on C Lightning a lot more than he would have done with Bitcoin Core right now. <laughs> and I think there's also something that is special about Lightning uh, as opposed to other crypto projects. It's not driven by a single company or an entity. It's an open source project. The specs are open source. Anyone can, can contribute. And then you have, yes, yeah, yeah. then you have different implementations and you can build your own from the specs. But it's, it is a really special structure that you don't find in, in many other projects. And I think that's one of the reasons why it, it has picked up the way it, it has. Uh, that well, to, to be fair, uh, the bold specs are probably not the easiest ones to read, and I'm probably also at fault for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I do agree that this this having having a spec come first and then everybody else implements it um, is is really important. It it also having multiple companies work on this it gives us this sort of trial by fire, right? We all come from different uh, different uh, directions. We all have different requirements. I mean, you concentrate mostly on uh, on, on mobile phones and uh, a device that that are very restricted in in, in both uh, resources and. and and bandwidth, um, whereas we work on sort of a service side implementation, and, and LND is working on a desktop implementation. So your requirements are quite different from uh, from what uh, from what ours are, and and still we manage by by through this proposal and discussion process, we, we end up with a with a uh, solution that might not resemble the initial proposal anymore, but uh, which has has had this discussion and, and is now better for it. Yes. Um, so should we talk like the sort of future? So right now there's a you know a bunch of different companies, a bunch of people using it. Uh, I don't know if Exchange like so. Initial thoughts were like, okay, exchanges should do this. You shouldn't have to deposit to an exchange. I guess uh, Arwen, what what like some people in, uh, I know uh, Ethan and yeah in in Boston is making. It's sort of it's not. I don't know if he called, I think he just says it's not really a lightning channel because it works on coins without SegWit. And so it's similar, but not the same thing. But it, it, it does let you have a channel with an exchange. So instead of deposit, it's, you know, move move to one side of a channel if I want to buy or sell. Um, and it's, but it's still pretty nascent. Like most exchanges aren't doing this. And so there's still a lot of custody. Uh, and I, I feel like hopefully we'll start to get, you know, less custody, more channels. Um, but like, what do you? What about sort of the future? Like, what what do you guys think are, you know, use cases you're seeing or that that are starting or not not there yet? Um, that's a good one. Um, I, I'm not sure it's our, our job to to think of the use cases. No, pr probably probably it isn't. Probably we can't even come up with this. And and I mean, uh, when when the internet was invented, like. 25 to 30 years ago, or when it became popular, uh, the the guys, the big guns nowadays did not exist, and, and we wouldn't, we couldn't re, uh, even pre, uh, see what what would be a, a useful thing. But there are use cases that I find personally interesting, and that that I find are worthwhile to to pursue. And and for me, that that is one of the things that is utterly broken in the current uh, internet is is how uh, content creators get get uh, mm -hmm. get uh, paid for their contributions right currently we have this huge stack of advertisers and basically every every company becomes this one trick pony as, as somebody from Andreessen Horowitz uh, mentioned uh, uh, recently is every every single company out there that is doing something with the web currently has acquired some users then uh, become popular and then show them ads 
or create profiles for the users and then show them targeted ads because, well, you can charge more for that. And why, why are people actually using that? That's the only way to actually make money on, on the internet right now. And, and that's, that's a really poor state of affairs. And, and I would really like to have a system where, where we can fairly compensate people that created, uh, created content that we consume without them having to go through all of these intermediaries and these intermediaries just collecting a bunch of profiles for us to uh, to to target us better I mean that's that's sort of backwards isn't it and what ends up at, at the content creator then is only a small fraction of what what the value charged to ad, uh, advertisees is so um, I think that's that's definitely a direction that I would like to go for but I definitely don't claim that that it's it's the killer app that, that we're looking for or that it will even uh, happen. It might be, be something that, that we can't think of uh, ourselves. Yeah. Um, so there's a question. Oh, Fabrice, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Keep going. Oh, there is a question from the audience. Cool. Yep, uh, the network topology has been kind of a point of, contro point of controversy. Um, do you, did, does the current state of the network concern you at all, or when you look at it, uh, d d d does it meet your expectations, or does it deviate from your expectations of what the topology would end up like at this point of maturity? And do you think it's going to evolve in a different direction? Uh, I think it's fine. <laughs> so uh, well, one thing that that <clears throat> that I recently read, and uh, I, I can't really remember where it was, but it, it, they were basically saying that uh, that the current network really looks like a scale-free network. From uh, and and one property for scale-free networks is that uh, they are pretty resilient to random failures, and uh, so so that's encouraging. On the other side, there are nodes with a with a with quite a lot of uh, capacity and a lot of a high in degree and uh, of, of edges and if there are targeted failures we might end up with a with a network actually being uh, being shut down it's, it's tricky because that that also is more efficient right so like right if you, if you want efficiency you have like a node with like really high degree and then your your routes are going to be really short um, but then it becomes more fragile and so it's like I think one of the other issues is there's not really attacks. Like we're not we're not seeing people aren't like trying to like actively hack and break this. Maybe the way I, I probably should write up the ones that I came up with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not sure I actually want to do that. But right, most most of the people who are finding problems are the ones working on building this. Right, it's not like you you have like weird things being exploited and you have no idea what's going on. Um, so so. If that's the case, and I think that's sort of the case in a lot of things in Bitcoin as well, then yeah, you're going to gravitate towards a more efficient system that might be a little more brittle. And there's also something that the network that you see with explorers is the public network, but it's it's very different from what you actually have on Lightning. For example, a terminal nodes, the one that either just send payments or receive payments, are not visible on the network. Mobile nodes are not visible on the network. None of the channels that are created with mobile wallets are, are visible on the explorers. So w what you see is actually the, the, um, the, the core network that actually does root payments. But the, the whole, there's a whole bunch of channels and nodes that you don't see. And as it is today, uh, with the number of nodes and channels you have publicly, you could serve a lot of users, millions of users, um, without having more channels. You don't need to have one public node for every user or one public channel for every user. So it, uh, uh, Lightning Explorers also have a really bad track record about keeping their data up to date. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that some of them show really old, non-existent uh, nodes uh, uh, that shouldn't be there anymore. And I think that there is a point in us attacking our own network. To be honest, um, we should, we we could try to to run of the uh, run some of the attacks that are being talked about, and academia is, is starting to find, and uh, and just discourage people from actually running these huge degree nodes that then become a single point of failure in the network. And uh, I I think we should we should probably. Uh, educate people about uh, about the issues that a centralized network might have. We shouldn't exaggerate what these issues are. Uh, we should be realistic in, in what they are. 
uh, in both directions. Don't play them down and, and don't exaggerate them. Um, and we should test how efficiently uh, how efficient they are in, in destroying the network. And by doing so, we can we can build a better network. Um. Uh, hi. So. Uh, could you perhaps uh, have a short discussion on uh, comparing HTLCs and the interledger protocol, particularly with uh, respect of the capital lockup and how, um, for example, if you have a trade that depends on an HTLC, you have an American call options problem? Okay. I'm yeah. not that familiar with interledger. So, so I, I think I've, I've there's a Stanford thing where he was, you know, HDLC is considered harmful, was the name of the talk. And I was like, them's fighting words. Um, <laughs> the, so I, I, you know, as, actually, Joseph named them HDLCs. But as, like, you know, introducing them, obviously, I think HDLCs are a great idea. Um, they, they certainly have their limitations. But in, in a system where you just sort of optimistically, you know, I'll send a Satoshi forward it on, and then the receiving node says, yeah, I got it. And I'm like, OK, I'll send another Satoshi, or maybe I double it each time or something. Yeah. Um, that can work in many cases. I think a, a, it's a big part of what HTLCs let you do is blame people, um, is that if, you, if, if someone stalls or if someone fails to release something or you know, it doesn't get through, you can have incentives where, like, so this isn't, like Rusty keeps talking about it, but it's not actually implemented where you say, OK, I, I demand a proof that some channel downstream from me has closed. Right. Uh, and then I can very quickly see, like, okay, this is the person whose fault it was, so I don't have to close. Um, so that kind of thing is much harder when you don't have uh, an HDLC. And, and then you can get, if for multiple hops, it's not clear who, who did the wrong thing. Uh, so I think a lot of, and so I don't know exactly the details of how Interledger deals with, like, blaming people. Um, but once you get to like longer channels where you have you don't you're not even sure who's in the middle, uh, HTLCs a big part of it becomes about blaming people. Well, and and of course uh, HTLCs are constant in time, whereas streaming payments aren't. Yeah, and you you can make it sort of all or nothing. Uh, so like the and then I guess people the optionality of swaps. I guess in 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 the bold spec anyway, there's nothing about multiple currencies. Uh, and like people like so that's sort of a separate angle that people are looking at. I, I think like, yeah, it is a downside in that if you want, I want to trade, you know, Bitcoins for Litecoins, I guess, as SegWit. Um, yeah, that whoever, you know, whoever's releasing that R value, they have a lot of, you know, freedom in, in when they do so. Um, but that can be priced in, I guess. You know, I, I don't think yeah. the solution is, okay, let's try to crank the knob to make it like really tight timing on these different chains. I think the solution is, okay, well, you're, you're not buying direct swaps. You're buying this option. And the person who's, who's at the end, who releases their value, well, they pay some more because they've got this, this time yeah. freedom. Um, have, you, have you looked at? Uh, <laughs> we focus on Bitcoin mostly. We, we did an experiment on Litecoin because we didn't have a choice when SegWit was not. Wait, wait, you focus on Bitcoin? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so no, we don't plan to implement swaps, not in the near future anyway. So we, we've also rejected quite a few uh, pro, uh, pull requests for uh, alternative currencies because, well, it, it's just a burden to support them. And uh, we support uh, Bitcoin Rectest, Testnet, and Mainnet, and Litecoin because Litecoin was our test balloon for uh, the SegWit activation. And that's all the currency we, uh, currencies we currently have. I mean, you're obviously free to, uh, to, to build your own swap-based uh, exchange, but you have to be aware that there are certain risks involved, yes. Hi. My Hi. first Bitcoin wallet um, ran on my cell phone. And I had to wait for to catch up with all the data. A long time ago. That would have been 2011. And Bitcoin has come a very, very long way. There are lots of alt, alt currencies, etc. And some have come and some have gone. And there is a large wake of dead blockchain data. And some of us have built systems that rely on information in contracts and other things on that data. Who, aside from me, uh, who actually is thinking about how we engage with the data 
in a blockchain that no longer has mining on it? Uh, I don't think no, or nobody's proposing to remove mining from... from. I mean, are, are you talking about Bitcoin or like other coins that have died off? or Because in Bitcoin, there's lots of mining. <laughs> I, I understand that there's lots of mining in Bitcoin right now. Okay, but there are other blockchain technologies. But, and so as you extend out and say, I want to interface between Bitcoin and other things, I want to sit there and talk to contracts, I want to go and interface with something from the Bitcoin blockchain and rely on data outside of the blockchain itself. What is the mechanism for, for preservation of the external data that people in those contracts will rely on in the event that those external data storage chains are no longer active. So um, yes, so, so so one one of the um, often cited advantages of, uh, of of Lightning is that we no longer store individual payments or individual data points in the in the blockchain itself. And the reason why that's that's cited as a positive is because well, it makes profiling hard. Um, but you're right. If if we build uh, build systems on top of that information that is no longer re uh, 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 stored in a blockchain, then we might have a bit of a hard time. Uh, then again, I mean, uh, this information belongs to the part, uh, to the people that actually participated in the payment in this case, and they can still provide uh, provide this extra information anchored into the source of truth, which in our case is the Bitcoin blockchain, and have uh, they have now the power to selectively show this information to participants that might require it. So it's now, it's, uh, it's no longer just this broadcast medium where we insert data into a blockchain and just everybody can read from it, but it's now data that belongs to somebody, namely the participants of a payment, that are in, empowered to either show you this information or keep it secret from you if, if they don't want to share it. I guess I could, I'm not 100% clear, but, but in, in many cases, uh, so like I, I have a paper discrete log contracts which uses lightning channels and you can put external data into it uh, in a way that no one can tell that you're doing so. Um, so so in, in many cases the solution would be, okay, it is the responsibility of the contract participants to manage the data that's going into these contracts. Um, but you can make it small enough that you know your your wallet is storing this stuff, and you're you're not querying out to some database all the time. So that's one potential solution. Cool. So, um, up there. Just shout. It works. <laughs> Um, so I want to, to just get back on the HLC's questions. I do want to clarify one thing, which is my fault for sort of the lack of this in the talk. But Interledger does use HTLCs for exactly what you're referring to, for attribution between counterparties. What it doesn't have is ledger enforcement of those HTLCs. So you can, when you have a multi, uh, long multi-hop uh, payment, attribute any faults. Um, the immediate counterparty to that particular um, node can attribute that fault and therefore can close the channel if they um, steal that payment. And I'm happy to discuss that part offline. Um, I recognize that the American call option issue only applies for multi-asset network, but there's another problem with HLCs, which is the griefing attack that's possible on the network, where if you receive a, pay a long multi-hop payment, you can just decline to fulfill that HTLC and therefore mock lock up a multiple of your capital on the network. So how do you, how would you address that? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what are, you, are you concerned about what that could do to the network, to the Lightning Network, if you don't, if you use HLCs? So like the receiver doesn't release R. Yeah. 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 It, you close the channel. I mean, <laughs> a lot of these things are like, you, you close the channel and then things time out. Um, so there, there is there is questions where we don't have a definitive answer, and this is this is definitely one of them. Um, and as a former researcher or current researcher, this is this is really the interesting stuff that that makes makes this interesting, right? This is this is a problem where we where we uh, where we can put some energy into it and come up with new solutions, and hopefully we can eventually solve this. But we don't have a definitive answer right now. But if you're connected, if you have a channel with a node that is not playing nice because it, it, it is slower because it's not responding, uh, you're locking up money that is basically useless. So you will eventually close that channel. 
So it, it's not a definitive answer, but, but you will clean your channels uh, eventually and, and maybe not connect to that node again. But if, if, if a channel is, is not responsive, it's not usable, and you have locked money in it, you won't keep it open. With HLCs, it's not just the immediate counterparty you speak, it's the entire chain of upstream. Um, routers, yeah, but right? th there is a node that, is, that has a direct channel that is not working. So eventually, there's, it doesn't make sense for them to keep it open. So if, if, if you're a bad actor in this network, then, then it's quite, uh, quite likely that eventually everybody will just hate you and not connect to you anymore. And uh, this, this attack not exactly being free also means that you are putting, putting aside some collateral with it. Now, the griefing attack allows you to have multiple of, of that amount being locked up, but it's still not free, and you basically, you basically become really unpopular on the network. Cool. So I, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, one, uh, I know a lot of people talk about, like, the fact that Lightning uh, allows people to make transactions that they wouldn't otherwise be able to make on chain, such as like dust transactions or even sub Satoshi transactions, and there's some arguments that that could be trusted in some ways. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how you guys think about that and how you get around that trustedness. Um, and then on a slightly related but but different topic for. Uh, those of us who are slightly less technical in the room, um, how do you see you know, people getting onboarded more and more as we go forward? Because you know, like, at least what's visible, there's you know, over 600 BTC on, the, on Lightning right now, but there's still like, a long way to go, right? So those are two things I've been wondering about. If you can just touch on them quickly. So, so with the trustedness, you, you mean that uh, some of the payments are so small that you can't really enforce them on, uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain? Yeah. Okay. And the whole sub thing. <laughs> well, the, I, the, I, the, I, the whole, uh, whole sub-dust thing. Yeah, so, well, uh, there's two, right? There's, there's sub-Satoshi, which is like could never possibly yeah. do anything. And then there's there's. So, so, so the way I remember Mila Satoshi's being introduced no, was, was... Joseph, yeah. What was that? I, Credits. OK. No, I was always against it. So I'm still, I'm still like in the Australia <laughs> thing. Like we need to get rid of, get rid of sub Satoshi. And okay, appar on. apparently it was Joseph. But yeah. uh, but the basic idea was that uh, that he said that uh, okay, we can we can send one one hundred millionth of a of a Bitcoin, yeah. and Bitcoin currently is over one thousand dollars. So uh, one millionth of a cent is still bigger than a Satoshi. So we can't talk about micropayments when it comes to, to Bitcoin anymore. And then somebody spun off and said, oh, we should, we should actually do our internal accounting in uh, thousands of a Satoshi. And that's where the whole yeah. milli Satoshi thing came from. Um, but yes, you're, you're right. We can't really enforce them on, uh, on chain. Uh, but as I mentioned, it, it's basically an account uh, bookkeeping trick, right? Uh, if we if we accumulate enough uh, uh, enough of these tiny payments, then eventually we will come uh, go above a threshold that can actually be enforced. And probably it's only then when you actually care about this, because well, if if the value is so small that that you can't represent it in your in your system and you're rounding down amounts of satoshis anyway, then it's highly uh, highly likely that you don't really care uh, about these tiny amounts until you have millions of them, and then you actually can enforce them again. So it's more of internal bookkeeping rather than anything else. And then I was hoping, Fabrice, you might touch on the onboarding, since you've been working in the mobile pay mobile uh, wallet space. Yeah, uh, our idea is if we want Lightning to grow, and for this, it needs to be reliable, and you need to have uh, good tools for everyone. And we believe that, uh, basically, if you want to build a Lightning wallet, you have three options today. It's a custodian, it's a remote control, that is, you have a Lightning node somewhere, and you have a, a small application that controls it. Uh, and you can try to have a, a full Lightning node that runs on your mobile. That's what we're trying to do. And we have to deal with the limitations of what you can do on a mobile. And the biggest limitation is it's offline most of the time. So you have to catch up when you start. And if you want something that is usable within a few seconds, then you need to catch up on the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain. We do this uh, through uh, the uh, Electrum protocol. And you have to catch up on Lightning. And 
you have your view, local view of the routing network has to be good enough so you can route payments uh, as soon as you are started. And um, we're, we're pushing hard for small changes in specs that will accommodate these use cases uh, using uh, basically being able to synchronize your network view as quickly as possible. But we believe that um, providing users with um, all the options of a full lightning node is one of the best ways to onboard users. And having a network that is as, as reliable as possible is a good way of, of making people invent use cases. And that's what I meant when I said we don't, I don't I'm not saying we don't care about use cases, but things like Satoshi's place or that uh, the, the, the chicken camera feed is, is it, it's fun and it's not something we came, we, we came up with. And I think if we build good pipes for payments and good, tool, good tools to use the pipes, people will build things with it. Yeah, I think we should also mention that uh, you, you mentioned these uh, three graduations of, mm. uh, of uh, nodes. Uh, basically, have a custodial wallet, or have uh, have a remote controlled wallet, or have a full node on your on your phone. Basically, those are not really discrete steps, right? There's yes. graduations yes. of this, and and. Uh, it's interesting for me, for example, to, to see that some of these graduations are worse than <laughs> than, uh, than, than uh, a custodial wallet, for example. Uh, there is, for example, a fork of, uh, of Eclair, which uh, shall not be named, um, which uh, has outsourced the route finding and the maintenance of the, of the local topology view uh, to a centralized server. And uh, that's really the worst of both worlds because, well, you're basically telling the service, hey, I'd like to send five bucks for my coffee there. Please give me a path. But you're still, uh, you're still able to lose your phone and uh, hence lose your money, right? So you've given away all of your privacy but still have the cap uh, c uh, capacity of actually losing your, uh, your money. Um, and, and so I, I think that's, that's important to see that it, it's it's a hard challenge, and, and but it's worth tackling it. Yes, because if, if we can't provide the option, then you're, you're stuck. At least if you have the option, you can choose not to use it, and maybe lose some privacy and, and something that is faster to use. But at least we'd like to, to push things as far as they will go with, with the, the, the current specs. I mean, the, the, the main reason for a lot of these things is the resource cost yes. of the actual running. So so the more, the more you can optimize, the more you can reduce this. Mm -hmm. Then you give you give people options. Just because it's easier to run, you know, Electrum than blockchain.info, uh, or I mean, the opposite, I guess. It, you know, you, you try to make them as easy as possible, as possible, but you still are going to have people using, you know, hosted, right, custodial stuff. And and, and I think that's that's perfectly fair, right? I mean, we we can't force people to use the most secure version and to spend the time to become informed about what is out there. And that this doesn't just apply to Lightning, by the way. This is this is for cool. Bitcoin and, and all of the security-related uh, information. We only, The only thing we as developers can do is give options that sort of have good trade-offs. And, uh, uh, and if, if people are willing to go that extra mile and invest time to, to learn about the trade-offs and then make an informed decision, that's fine, but we can't force them and we shouldn't shame people for not going that extra mile. Uh, because there, there's far more important stuff that they need to do in their day-to-day -day lives. And, and so we, we need to work hard on making these secure options easy to use and, and accessible. And, and but but we really don't have any any power uh, over their decisions, and that's perfectly fine. Hmm. So I think we're running short on time. We have time for like two more questions. I know that you two have had your hands raised for a while, so okay. let's just do those Great. two and then um, we'll break for lunch. There's a, a ton of fascination in like the broader crypto space with you know the identity solution, right? Um, I think it was maybe a month or two months ago on the Lightning Dev um, mailing list where there was talk about. Um, proof of payment as a stand-in for that, um, with just, just using hash pre-images as showing, you know, you don't need to know who I am, but you can see that I have paid for this piece of digital content in the past. Um, I was wondering if you guys could kind of expand on that um, and, and talk about kind of how, specifically, I'm really interested in, in the mechanism of how that would work of, you know, securely storing hash pre-images, maybe in a Fabrice in a, in a mobile environment. Um, so just kind of proof of payment overall and then kind of the mechanism of, of, of how it would work. 
So uh, Rusty is a bit critical about using pre-images just for, uh, uh, only pre-images for, for authentication uh, uh, sakes, especially because these pre-images are shared with the wider network or at least with the, with the participants of the route that, that you've taken, right? Uh, so there is no really unique way of saying, hey, I'm the guy who paid it. I, there's just a way of saying, hey, somebody paid this and, and we should be fine with this. And that matches, that matches the usual use case that, that I go to when, when I say, hey, we have an agreement that if I pay X, I will get delivery of, of service Y. And then I can show the pre-image and say, hey, this contract, by the way, was fulfilled and I should be getting whatever was promised to me. Um, without auxiliary information, it's probably not a good idea to just use pre-images uh, for authentication. Uh, but yeah, there's there's more advanced things we can do that that would give you way way more security when it comes to uh, in, uh, uh, to to uh, identifying the one who paid and making it per a personalized proof of payment uh, that that does not give a wider uh, network the the access to whatever you're trying to protect. There's a, there's a bunch of trade-offs in Lightning, more so than Bitcoin, where there's like identity. Whereas in Bitcoin, you're like, I have my node. I, I, don't, I, want as, I don't want to minimize his identity pretty much everywhere I can. Uh, nodes don't have publicly identifiable keys. Uh, you know, you want addresses to be one-time use, all these things. Whereas in Lightning, it's like, no, these nodes do have an identity. And you do sort of build up a, a type of reputation that we were saying. Um, but it's tricky. Like, you don't, you don't want an identity, but you need some of these things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a... It's a trickier problem. All right, I'll go. Um, so my question is uh, mostly from the perspective of someone who's actually working on Interledger, and we use Lightning for like micropayments between counterparties. Um, and one thing that I've noticed today that I'm really curious about how you guys think about this in the future is like multi-hop payments are first-class citizen in Lightning. How is the time latency going to be from a UX perspective? Because today, at least, and I have no idea like how far this projects in the future, a one-hop payment is a wonderful, beautiful experience in Lightning. Even a two-hop payment is a terrible experience in Lightning. Latencies go up to like one, two seconds, and I'm trying to send 100 of them. Like, it's just not going to happen fast enough for my use case. And so like, what are the odds of you know, five-hop payments being fast in Lightning in five years? Or should I think of that as like an unlikely thing to happen? Uh, so, so without anything that is guiding the network construction towards having local channels first, uh, you will probably see a uh, uh, very high latency for, for the foreseeable future at least, uh, because speed of light doesn't change all that often. Um, and, 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 the, uh, uh, and having round trips over to, from here to Australia and back and forth like four times, uh, that's still going to be uh, uh, quite a long time. But uh, th there are some ideas being floated about uh, about this network being built from from actual use of, uh, of it. And since we're in the same room, it's quite, uh, quite a lot more likely that we have a transfer uh, uh, between us rather than me sending to somebody in Australia. So the density of the network might correspond to, uh, to a local distance as well. For, for a scale-free graph, five hops seems like really long. Like you might someday, but it, it just seems like you know, you'll have a Pareto distribution of, yeah, most payments are one or two hops. And then it gets, as you get it further in hops, they become very infrequent. And so it's, it's annoying that it takes a longer time, but you rarely have to deal with it, probably. So the, 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 the diameter of the current network, uh, of the current strongly connected component is five, by the way. Uh, so that's, that's probably the absolute worst case you, uh, you could encounter in, in today's network. Although I've seen people route through nine, just for but fun. probably for fun. <laughs> for fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. I, I think we could probably keep asking you guys questions all day oh, long. We, we will be around, so yeah. if, if, um, if you catch us, uh, at least I'm happy to talk lightning all day long. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's, let's give a round of applause to uh, Fabrice, Taj, and, and, and 